Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Alex. I'm Nita. Um, I'm the founder of Startup CFO Solutions, and I'm so, so excited to be here, so much so that I told Alex just before everyone joined that I haven't had coffee today um, because I'm just so excited and I don't need it, which is um, crazy because I normally drink about three or four cups. Um, I'm here in LA and happy to get um, started. Um, Alex, do you want to give me the... Um, Oh, um, the or should I just share my screen? I don't know. If oh, I you can it. share it. Okay. Let me know if you have any issues. Okay. So um, I'm just sharing um, a deck with everyone right now. Um, so this session is about getting into the nitty gritty of the numbers. Um, and the three areas that I wanted to focus on because I think it will be impactful for you all, but obviously you know most, um, so feel free to put questions in the chat, is firstly, achieving double digit revenue growth and staying within your cash runway. Um, secondly, how do you get to that XX million valuation by building a blueprint for growth? And then thirdly, how do you raise X million dollars in capital by showing VCs that you know how to operate and scale your startup? Um, so quick bit of background on me. I am originally from the UK, born and brought up um, and then moved to New York um, and just moved to LA. And all those moves have been done by a career in finance. Um, so I worked at PwC and um, BlackRock and Citigroup, and I just got fed up of being a cog in a wheel. I wanted to work with people who are doing something different. And that's why I started my business, where I work directly with founders like yourself on growing and scaling operations. And that's what brought me to Alex and to all of you. So just, um, ex you know. Just to top that off, in case I didn't say it, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> oh, um, forgot, I, I forgot to, <laughs> to preface this for you because we talked about this before the, the we had everyone come in. Um, so the way we're going to streamline this is we're going to make it interactive and ask um, and answer questions. However, because we want to get through each section and it's super easy to go hard on questions, um, we're going to go through... Um, the three sections and then towards the end of each section we'll pause and have questions, however, while she's presenting if a question pops up for you put it in the chat because we'll prioritize whoever asked the question first and go through those questions. Um, that way, and let's say if we're not able to get to your question we will find a way that we can get an answer for you, um, but that's how we're going to do it, so if you do have a question don't hesitate to put it in chat after each section we're going to go and um, answer those questions awesome i'm going to shut my mouth now Nita. Thanks Alex um, for that comment, so um, I will kick off with how to achieve double digit revenue growth and stay within your. Um, cash runway. I think this is a really important question because it's basically you're trying to achieve a lot to get customers, get users, get the revenue growth with limited resources. And that limited resources part of it is really important. That's when it's really about prioritization and thinking ahead of time where the highest value add spend is going to be. Um, and so that's why I really wanted to dive into this area and just give my top four kind of things that I would like everyone to be thinking about and have their mind on in order to do this. Um, um, so the first one is business model. That really matters. So before you get into any numbers or ever, any revenue growth, you want a business model if you're going to get double digit revenue growth your market size and growth potential needs to be huge you know the pie is big you can create a pathway to get your share of that revenue um and and that market size is up to you to define you know is it your industry is it a certain niche of people is it across geographies um or just one country um so that's one thing I think the second thing is having a scalable business model. And that means like the way you think about how you're going to set up your operations and get clients and service them and deliver their product um, and check in with them 
um, and do everything that needs to be done to run your business? Is that scalable? Um, which means that your revenue can grow faster than your cost base. Um, the third thing is an unmet need. Um, you know, making sure you know that there is specifically an unmet need um, and how to value it. And all of this, by the way, it's, I know it's a very high level point. Um, it takes iteration and data and learnings in order to get to this stage. So it's important to think about, you know, are you at this stage yet? Are you going through this iteration um, and aim to get there? So that's um, my first point around um, maximizing revenue growth with limited resources. The second point is um, maximizing the value of your customer relative to the cost it takes to acquire them. Um, so CLTV, customer lifetime value. Well, customers are your biggest asset and you're thinking about what their value is. Um, and CLTV is a metric that is used to try and quantify and measure what they will be spending with you, net of all the selling expenses over their lifetime. Um, so the calculation is one thing, but the concept is also really important because it's about saying that your um, customer lifetime value is a function of the net margin you generate from that customer, the length of time that they're an active customer for, which is also called customer lifespan, and the frequency with which they purchase, if it's product, um, or you know how often they're subscribing or paying if it's a subscription-based product. Um, so those three things are what you really want to focus on growing in order to maximize your customer lifetime value. Um, and then the other thing is not to look at customer lifetime value in, in, um, in isolation. It could be that they're spending $1,000 with you for an average of three years um, and the margin is $1,500. So maybe the value is $4,500 for one customer. Um, but is that good or bad? Does that mean you know, you're spending in the right areas or not? It just depends also on, on CAC or the cost um, it takes to acquire your client or customer. Um, and this is basically the sum of all the sales and marketing, um, advertising costs, salaries of staff working in sales and marketing. So everything that you're spending in your business to acquire the client um, and your business model will be successful and your revenue growth will materialize if you're able to really maximize that ratio of having CLTV versus CAC be a high number. Um, and that will also inform that you're spending money in the right way, because if you feel like it's not the right ratio, you have many, you have different tools at your disposal to try and think about how you can improve it. Um, maybe, um, and my, my next point is about how to minimize CAC. It's really about knowing your customers. So if you're thinking your CAC is too high, it's really important to focus on, do you know your customer? Um, and by that, I mean the customer persona. You might have a few, you might have one, but what is that person that needs what you are selling? What's, the, what's their name? Like if you were to give them a personification, what's their name? Where do they live? What do they like? Who are they as a person? Um, that really helps you know your customer. And once you do that, you can understand them and research into them. And I think that stage is super important for cash management because if you understand and research them, your marketing activities, which will be taking place when you have a new business, you can actually prioritize those marketing efforts in a way that follows the customer's journey. So the customer journey is the, the kind of um, thought process a customer goes through in order to make a buying decision. And it starts with awareness um, that they even know that this exists. They might be considering it internally. Um, they purchase it at some point. And the highest end of the customer journey is, oh, my God, I bought this thing. I love it. I have to tell Alex about it and Laurie about it. And so they become an advocate. So knowing that 
and, and every customer's journey is different. So knowing your customer, knowing your their journey helps you understand where in the marketing funnel you should be spending your money to get revenue growth. Um, and it's top of funnel or bottom of funnel. Um, and those are all um, different areas of focus. I think often with DTC brands, we focus on the, the bottom of uh, the, the kind of um, bottom of funnel first, um, which is like online um, social media advertising and things like that, which is, um, it can be cost effective, but over the long run, that can actually increase your cost of advertising um, because people become less um, able to kind of respond to that advertising. So that those are just things to think about your CAC and how you spend to acquire your customer is really a function of knowing who they are um, and spending in the right way. Um, and that's what you need to conserve cash in order to then grow your revenue. Um, so those are like my tips that I would focus on for growing revenue in a constrained way. Um, and then my other areas that I think are really important for cash management um, the third point is basically using equity instead of cash. Um, and that's a great way to maximize your cash runway. So that means that for co-founders, advisors, early employees, you're really giving them a piece of your business instead of cash. Um, and the benefit is it saves cash flow and it also aligns what they're doing and their performance directly to the growth of your business. So just around how you think about equity, um, if you have a co-founder or you're thinking of getting a co-founder, that's a, a decision, a personal decision. Um, you, what I advise is splitting the um, decision in, of how to split equity into two parts. One would be de deciding on the kind of framework you would use to split equity. And then the second would be to actually attribute numbers to how to do that. And the reason I make this point is because equitable does not always mean equal. So like four to five years for founders or employees. Um, and there's normally a cliff, which means you wait one year before any shares vest, before you get like the full rights to any of those shares. Um, and for advisors, um, someone who's helping you a little bit, it might be about two years. Um, and advisors are also a great way to grow your revenue and your business, but without cash flow. Um, without using up cash flow. And the trick here is number one, to make sure that you're really getting the right advisors that you need. So for example, expertise about go to market. If you're in a specific industry like healthcare or health tech um, or FinTech, it may be an advisor that's a really well known and has experience in that industry, um, but you want to find someone that you can pay with stock options and not cash. Um, and typically for advisors, I would say the baseline is about 0.25% um, of your ownership. And that's like a very kind of low and loose baseline. You can just kind of scale that up and down depending on the type of role. Um, but obviously equity is also expensive in the sense you're giving away a part of your company. So you, you don't want to go too high, but it's a good way to conserve cash as well. Um, and these advisors are not part of your everyday team, like employers. So make sure you're really clear in terms of what you expect from them, like milestones and deliverables, so that they are actively out there helping you grow. And then my final point, I think a lot of the points I, I brought up are really about thinking through how you run your business and set up um, operations and decide where to spend um, uh, for marketing and, and get new customers. But equally, like super, super important is strong cash management. Um, so what I really like clients and founders to do is have a detailed cash flow forecast every month. And I do say every week, if you are low on cash or you're feeling like, you know, things are kind of 
done month to month, you're not sure where things are going. And unless you see it and you do it, you won't know. Um, bills don't come at the same time as you're using that spend. So you wouldn't know that a bill is coming now for the quarter just gone. So that cash flow forecast really helps you know what you've paid and what's left. Um, and the reason why you can do that is that you can calculate your burn rate, which is how much you're spending every month net of money coming in. So it's actually like a negative number. If you've got a positive burn rate, that means you're spending more than you're getting in revenue. Um, and it's really important because you can use that burn rate if you've seen what it is for a few months, then you know how long your runway is. Um, and basically your runway is the length of time um, before you run out of cash completely. Um, and you don't ever want to get down to a zero runway um, because that puts you in a really weak position. And if you do, you know, that you'll find a way to pivot out of it, I'm sure. But from the offset, from the outset, you really need to think about um, probably allowing six months or longer to raise funds. So your, um, your runway should be at least six months, if not longer. And it's also a good way to think about how much you want to raise because if you know how much you're spending, a good kind of yardstick is have about 18 months of runway um, before you need to raise your next round. Um, so that's my first topic. I think I will pause there and ask if there are any questions um, before I dive into the other areas. I love this. Um, haven't seen questions, so put them in the chat now. I think they were just so mesmerized by what you're saying. Um, and I can happily continue on and, um, because, you know, it, if it's a good use of time, I was, the next topic I was going to talk about is how to get to the valuation you want by building that blueprint to show your growth, a, a model that lays out what's going to happen in your business. Um, and how that will create um, the value you're looking for. So I can move on to that topic, Alex. Um, um, so Brittany's actually asking, she said, can we see um, the marketing funnel one more time? Oh yeah, of course. Um, and I can um, create some, uh, you know, a sheet to send to you, Alex, if that's yes. helpful. Um, it, is it possible? Can we um, zoom into it? I think it's at 72% down there. Yeah. Hang on one minute. Maybe that's why. Okay. There we go. Very cool. Yeah, I really like this structure too for how founders can think about converting as well, because the path for whether you're B2B or B2C, there's no linear path for how people purchase from you. Yeah, uh, everyone's purchasing different, is uh, purchasing decisions different. So if you can really try and pinpoint this with some data and that data can be like, it doesn't have to be super fancy. It can be just talking to people um, you know, 10 people is better than nothing. You don't have to necessarily pay for market research, but something that you can then base your spending decisions on. Love it. And then we were asked by Jackie, can you go to slide nine? And then can we increase the amazing? Yes, I love this because this really drives home what you showed on the funnel. Yeah, so this is basically saying like, if you have something, you're, how do you um, move your customer along that journey? So it starts with awareness, consideration, and purchase. So how can you spend your money in a wise way that actually takes your target audience from yellow to orange to green? That's yeah. like your priority to grow revenue. And actually, to be honest, because we know CAC is also dependent on repeat frequency, it's also going to the pink because you want them to be an advocate. So they themselves become um, a source of selling for you by the way they speak about you and what they say to their friends and family and so on. Yeah, and I love this because I think a common mistake I see often with founders because this, this discussion doesn't happen as, as often is like, 
we hear tactics being thrown around like Facebook ads or da 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 da, da. Um, I honestly don't think Facebook ads is, are helpful until you understand your customer clearly. Um, otherwise you spend a lot of money and they're more expensive today, but I digress. Um, but I like this because it allows you to say like, if we're engaging in let's say email marketing, okay, that's at the top of the funnel. How do we move them for the rest of this funnel from that's awareness to consideration, purchase, retention, so on and so forth. And so um, I like this because you can start mapping that out for conversions, but also especially retention and advocacy, which I love about this. So yeah, and the other ways to think about what what you think about as your marketing budget, how do you want to spend it across this? And so you may decide for your type of product, you want to do some online ads to create awareness, have a website and um, also a newsletter so that you are turning the ones that you're capturing from the online ads into advocates as well. So it's picking and choosing because you have limited resources. You can't do everything. You don't have the money and you don't have the time to do everything. So that's like the biggest challenge, I think, with, with revenue growth. It's those constrained resources. And that's why I bring it back to prioritization and knowing the value and knowing what the the cost of acquisition is and what the customer lifetime value will be. You don't know that. No one knows that until you experiment. And, and that is, you know, the joy of having a startup. Yep. And then the coolest thing is when you experiment, which I love about this and people are loving your deck, Nita. Um, yes, we'll send you the slides. They love your slides. Um, is that you can put numbers to these things. So then you're not wasting time on activities that don't matter. Um, this is super helpful. Thank you, Nita. Let's go to your next section. I think this will clarify a lot of what you're already talking about. Yeah, sure. So um, interestingly, no questions about any of the vesting stuff. Because um, uh, often I get questions on that as well. Um, okay, so um, going to the um, how to get to a valuation that you're thinking of by building a blueprint for growth. So first of all, what is valuation? Valuation is not a science and it's not an art either. It's a bit of both. Um, so you can try and control both elements of it. Um, the, the building a blueprint for growth is understanding that valuation is dependent on revenue and profits that you are getting today from your business or you'll be getting in the next year two years five years the point at which you sell your business um, you know what's your revenue and what's your profit and then there's the concept of a multiple which is the fact that someone who buys your business knows that they're going to be getting that into perpetuity or for a few years, or there's some extra value than just what you get in a, in one year. So that's the multiple that they'll put on it. Um, and there are some industry norms for multiples. Um, and that's kind of the science behind it that you might hear people talking about. Um, and that could be something like a multiple of six on revenue is what a tech company is selling for that's just like very um broad um that that is one element to think about and so when you build your financial models you should think about how you will get to that multiple by working backwards like if i want to have a multiple of um a valuation of um 10 million and I think the multiple for my industry is roughly five, I need to get to revenue of 2 million, um, at least ideally it would be profits of 2 million, but that can vary depending on the type of startup. And um, you know, if you're showing that you're onto something really big, then they may be okay valuing it on revenue and um, less um, focus on the profits. But that's basically the, the thinking behind it. Um, so, so the other advice I would give is obviously to get to valuation, you also need to think about who your buyer would be and really put yourself in their shoes. So think now as you're starting up your business, would I want to sell it to a corporate? Who is that corporate I would want to sell it to and try and build a relationship and talk to them 
so that you're on their radar because sales take a long time and a lot of trust and there's no better time to start than now. But you may not know what you think about what I've just said. I'm just saying if you do, that's something to consider. But one thing you will need is a financial model which kind of um, displays the valuation in the same way that you're thinking. Um, so, so when you think about your financial model, um, it's really important to focus on your revenue for value. That will be the first thing and then your profitability. Um, so just make sure that your revenue is, um, if you're, building it up and you want it to be accurate, try and think through how you will, where, what the drivers of your revenue are. So for example, if you are um, expecting to get a certain return from your marketing spend, um, try and like have a number around, if I spend this much, then I will get this much in revenue, um, put some assumptions behind it, and then use your financial model to build up on that revenue using the CAC that you spent. Or if you have a B2B business and you're saying that I have a sales force out there and they are selling to organizations, maybe enterprise or small business, um, you know that your sales are going to be driven by the number of leads they have, the number of demos they do, the number of um, contract um, signings that they, well, it's contract signings and revenue stage, but you know, the, the stage before it. So those are the things that you can um, build into your model to say, okay, I'm gonna go after a thousand leads, which will turn into 200 demos, and that will turn into a hundred meetings and I don't know, 20 signed contracts. So that's why I'm going to get that revenue in that month. Um, and that's what you do every single month to show how you're going to grow your revenue. And it really gives you a driver based revenue flow, um, which is helpful because when you come to your expenses, you want that to be matching what you're showing in your revenue. So if you were thinking about that marketing spend and the return on it for your revenue, then you know when you go to your expenses section of your model, you have to make sure you've got your marketing spend in there in the same numbers that you were using to, to drive the revenue. Or if you you have a sales force, well, the cost of having all those leads and having all those meetings because of the time people need to do that, that's it should be embedded in your expenses. So it's really just making sure you've thought through things um, holistically. Um, the other things not to forget when it comes to expenses is hiring plans to build in the cost of employees, not just their salary, but any benefits and taxes you will need to be paying um, and uh, replenishing investments. Like if you have some sort of asset that you need to build, maybe it's a, a medical um, machinery or device or um, um, some, some, something physical or, or an investment, then make sure you're building in the fact that you will need to put money aside to replenish that. That could be like laptops even. Um, so those are the things you have to think about when you're building the financial model and then making sure that with all of that thought, the revenue comes out to what you're thinking of the value and if something doesn't work if you're like i'm doing this and what i'm thinking doesn't come out to the value i want then that's a great bit of information from you that it's time to go back to the drawing board or iterate or just think about is your is your business scalable enough um maybe there's some um maybe it's going to be a lower valuation you get to, or maybe you need to think of a business development tactic, like a strategic partnership, so that you can try and grow your revenue more quickly um, than just doing marketing by yourself. Partnerships can be a great way to do that. Um, but by laying it out in a, in a financial model that tries to get that value, you really see the, the blueprint and the pieces that make up getting there and then you can um, tweak them and ideally do that sooner rather than later awesome. um, so yeah I'll pause now if there's any questions yes we have a few questions on this one 
So Remy asks, is this something we can try and figure out on our own or hire a valuation expert? I wouldn't hire a valuation expert at your stage. Um, I think you can research it depending on the specific industry. You can look at deals done recently in the space you're in. You can, I mean, it, there's a wealth of information available and there is no, um, there is no right or wrong because it's also about filling a need in a specific person or organization, that buyer that someone wouldn't know about. Like if you're close to selling, you could think about getting a formal valuation. Um, but I don't think that's really necessary at this stage. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, something I hear often with even the investors in our network is um, Aoi Young, who's awesome. She's exited two companies. Now she's a partner at X Factor Ventures. She was like to our founder, she was like, look, you know, we understand at this stage, you don't have enough data to build like a silver bullet valuation or silver bullet numbers around revenue or users. But it's really just showing that you contextualize it enough and thought logically through it enough that I have the confidence as an investor in you to guide us to navigating towards that. Um, so it's really about like, did you think logically through this? Um, and as Nita said, pulling those different variables in um, to decide if this is actually a logical way of thinking through it. And then Drakshan said, and I hope hopefully I said that correctly, is where can we find the multiple data for our industry? That's a great follow up. Um, I I mean I would just look around. There's like data sets. Um, there's data providers. Um, it's often published in like Wall Street Journal articles and things. So I don't think it's that hard to get a sense. Like I don't, you know, you may not get like a massive data set, mm -hmm. um, but I would look at like financial sources and um, tech, even like startup news. Say some like tech startup or tech crunch or stuff. They they crunch base. I think they will have that kind of information. Yeah, you're kind of just scrounging. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not. There's no, there's You're really no sense like, of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Find like this is especially early stage. It is, it's kind of messy. So unfortunately for y'all, but um, yes, let's see. Christy asks, who decides on evaluation based on revenue versus profit? Um, so there's some industry norms, like for example, in general, often technology companies. Uh, high growth startups can be valued on revenue. The baseline is profit because that's the cash you're getting out of a business. Um, but it really depends on what you're doing and how attractive that is to the end buyer. So if you're doing something and you're building something that is a really valuable business um, addition for Facebook and they're going to put it into their operations and just take what you've created and have those users and have that additional feature um, with their existing platform, they may not care about profit as much because the cost base for how they use it will be so different than you running your own company. Um, so there's no hard and fast rules, but those are like the general terms. Um, if you were selling to a small or a buyer that's just going to operate that business as it stands, just keep it going and do what you're doing, but they'll take over as the owners. That would almost certainly be based on net profit and not revenue because nothing's going to change. But where there's synergies between the buyer and the seller and they're trying to do something different, that's where they scope for maybe the revenue to be the driver. And it's also industry dependent as well. Awesome. Thank you, Nita. And it looks like those are the questions for this section. If you have more, feel free to add it in chat, but um, we can go to your next one. Okay, great. Um, so the next point I had was um, how to raise X dollars in capital by showing VCs you know how to operate and scale your startup. Um, so if you are going for VC capital, 
Um, just really quickly, here's some funding stats. I don't know if everyone here is going for VC capital or not, but this is from Fundable. And I think it's just interesting to know this if you're thinking about financing. So 57% of startups are funded by personal savings, 38% by friends and family, uh, less than a percent by angels and 0.05% by VCs. Um, so obviously, you know, most people are using their personal savings. But if you look at the amounts, if you're um, funded by yourself, the average amount is 58,000. And if you're funded by a VC, the average amount invested is 5.9 million. So there's a big um, difference in the amounts, um, but also the, the number of um, startups getting that funding. Um, so if you are going for VC funding, um, then I think the biggest thing um, that you have to do to operate, to show that you can operate and scale your startup is demonstrate credibility. Um, and that credibility is, is everything. It's like, and you could have the best idea, um, but you may not be the right person. So you really are selling yourself and your credibility. Um, and that's what it will take to build confidence that you know how to operate and scale this to the next level. So they don't know you and you know, investors don't know you. So they, how do you build credibility? It just goes down to those interactions that you have with them. Um, but the way, if you are interacting with them in terms of explaining your business and the materials that you put forward against your, for your business, like a pitch deck or a model, if all of that shows that you think um, in a way that's analytical or that you're basing what you're saying on some data or some findings or some research, um, um, and that you show that you understand your customer and that and their needs. That is, those are, that's the evidence that the investor gets, that you know how to, you have credibility and you know your space and you've done your research and they should put their trust in you. So I think it really does come down to um, qualities which are um, not necessarily so numbers driven or idea driven, but really you, your ability to be credible and build trust with them. Um, and the other way that you build trust is um, by not just um, basing what you're um, concluding and doing on data and research, but also showing why you're better than competitors. Because again, that shows that you've thought about the threats around you. Every business has threats. Um, your competitors are a threat. And you can show your investors by the way you um, are presenting that you've thought about those competitors and you have a rationale for why you're more compelling. The, the other thing is team. If you've built a team with relevant experience and expertise and network, then again, you know what you're talking about and you know how to build this business and scale it. You don't have to be the person who has all the experience or all the knowledge, um, but you do have to be credible enough that you know yourself and you know you don't. And that's OK, because you've built a team that can help in those ways. And then I think finally, um, I would really poke, poke holes in your business um, to prepare for um, showing VCs um, and investors how that you know how to grow and scale. So what are the mass, what are the key assumptions or uncertainties in your business model? And what would you do if they changed? Um, are there any dependencies that if this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen, then I'm not going to get to where I am. And what would you do if that happened? Um, and I'm not saying that you necessarily bring all of this up with the VCs yourself, but having that dialogue and considering it and talking to others about it will mean that you're thinking about it and 
and you're prepared for questions if they were to ask. And when they ask those questions, you don't know what they'll be, you're able to respond in a thoughtful manner. That really is what shows that you know how to operate and scale your, your startup. Doesn't mean you necessarily have like an amazing like golden solution for every single risk or dependency or uncertainty, um, but you've thought it through and you have some some pathway or some idea of how you would do it. And I will pause there for questions. That's actually the end of the structured presentation. So we have a good amount of time for um, questions, if there are any. Awesome. So what we'll do since she's done um, with the presentation, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask Nita. And don't be shy. This is something we have to do every time. But if you have a question, you're you're questioning yourself whether you should ask it. I guarantee you, someone else probably has the question. <laughs> no stupid questions. Yeah, and by the way, if it's questions um, about other topics not related to what I put in the presentation, that's fine as well because um, you know I just really want this to be as helpful to you as possible. Um, it's a question about I don't know accounting or QuickBooks or um, you know anything. Got it. Yes, um, Hermelinda, I understand what a SWAT is. However, when you said like a SWAT, what were you referring to? That she referenced. Yeah, because I was talking about threats. Um, I think that's a great framework um, to think about your business always and. And I had mentioned the threats to prepare for the VC meeting, but that's something you could constantly be doing and ahead of VC meeting for sure. Um, I don't, I wouldn't put it into like, I wouldn't formalize it in terms of saying, oh, present a SWOT to the VC. That's not what I'm saying, but I think it's a great framework to think about your own business and you know you've considered it from all angles if you've considered a SWOT and, um, and done that analysis. Got it. it. Looks like Andrew has a question. Yes, when you mentioned credibility is your biggest asset and in, in showing that you know your customer um, along with, you know, data conclusions and deck, um, would you also add that credibility in your, who you are and your background in, in the particular industry? Yeah, and what I merit you carry? Hi, Andrew. Um, How great. are you? Um, thank you for asking that. I, so um, I, earlier in my presentation, I said customers are your biggest asset. That's for sure. And then later in the presentation, I was saying VCs look for um, what you need to build with VCs is credibility. Um, okay. So it's not that credibility is your biggest asset, but those two things are definitely the case. And totally. I think that credibility is definitely about you and your experience as well for sure, um, but it's also at the same time, not a limiting factor. So you have to take what you've done to date in your career, in business, in school, in life, um, and use that to build credibility. Um, and if it's relevant, you know, present it in your background, which is something you could put on the deck, like who you are. Um, you know, just make sure it is relevant. Um, but if it is, then I would put that on and any other team members as well. Okay, one more question. Okay, you mentioned, um, which is, uh, you know, great, great point. Um, investing equity instead of cash. So do you have a chart or a, a measuring pool? You mentioned the 0 0.25 for advisors, but do you have a measuring pool for other um people that you may take on and what the maximum is and what you and what you would invest based on their what they bring to the table yeah if you understand I what would, i'm saying yeah i would um you you have to really think proactively about your cap table 
which you are by asking this question. It's a really, really important question. And I say like 0.25% for advisors because I know you're probably, you, know, you might have two or three um, and you employees, I would um, try to do like less than 5%. Uh, what the, the one thing I would do is think through to your future state, because if you are giving away too much equity, you won't be able to grow your business. It, there will be no more equity left and it, it will, you'll just limit the number of people you can get involved because if there's no more equity, then, um, you know, you'll struggle. So I, I would try and limit all of that because you will have like, if you're going to grow and scale, Later on, you'll have um, a separate like employee option pool that could be for you know many more employees that you're taking on. That could be something like twenty percent, and then VCs themselves would be taking not less than twenty percent of the cap table. So when you add all that up, you don't have a lot to play with, and you really want to keep it low at the early stages because there's too many founders I've seen that have been burnt by doing that. Yeah, that's a great point, especially um, it's looked and I one of my friends who raised um, quite a bit in his former company, he struggled at the later stages because he gave up too much equity early on and VCs frowned upon it um, because it was it showed to them that there wasn't much incentive for the founder because usually when you start raising, you keep raising and you're going to keep getting diluted. So it's actually not in the best interest, not first and foremost for the founder to give away too much. But also if you are raising, you're going to raise subsequent rounds. That is a red flag for investors. Um, Nita, my question to you to, to piggyback off the options pool, because we have some folks in here that may not raise or won't raise at all. But I do like this idea of how do you leverage different incentives for getting the right talent and advisors and such, what would you recommend or what have you seen um, companies doing that aren't necessarily going the funding route, but are able to leverage things like an equity to bring in the right talent to, so they're not relying just on cash alone? Um, so I'm sorry, what, what's your question? So if they're not raising, if they're not going to raise, and so there's not going to be like subsequent rounds, so on and so forth. What are some things you've seen on the financial side, founders leverage from an equity perspective where they're not using cash to, let's say, bring on advisors, bring on new team members? What are some things you've seen work well? So equity, equity is the, the thing you would use. Um, so you don't need to be raising around with VCs to, um, to, to use equity in your business to get um, employees or advisors or help. But the, the thing you should do with every, every bit of equity you give away, whether it's a co-founder um, or an advisor or an employee is to have vesting that's so important because I could be a co-founder and have my share of the company and then just decide that I'm not going to work on it anymore or we don't work well together um, and those shares are then mine. I own them. And so I will still therefore be getting the upside of the growth of the company forevermore until I decide what I want to do with those shares. Um, and that way you've really got some dead weight in your cap table. You've given away a certain percentage of the cap table all in one go at the beginning and you're not getting any con contribution for it. So a vesting schedule is a good way to make sure that whatever shares they're getting come over time. You do get them. You just don't get them all in year one. You get them a little bit next year and a little bit because, you know, you will be with me for the next five years and that way. If they're not, then um, they don't get all of it. Yeah, and I love a good vesting schedule. And most, uh, I think it's a requirement for most companies raising, but I think this is something any company could use is that if you are giving away equity instead of bringing on someone that's like, I'm gonna be here for a year and then I'm gonna walk away with all this equity and they didn't really put in the work um, that you could see the full ROI. 
usually you see vesting over four years so they won't be able to get all the shares that that was allotted to them un, until a certain cliff and so each year that they're with you equity is triggered and so on and so forth so it protects you yep. um and the cliff is just at the beginning just to clarify like, so cliff just means that you wait one year yeah. So cliff means like, let's say you gave me equity today. If it was with a cliff, that means one year I get nothing. Then the vesting schedule comes into right. full. the next year and the next year I get a 20%, then I get another 20%. And then by year five, I've got everything. And in all that time I had to work. And I knew that if I leave or if I just don't pull my weight or decide to sit around and do nothing, then I'm not going to get the remaining percentage of my shares. So it's a real incentive to stay committed in the long term. Um, and not just employees and, and advisors, you can do that with co-founders as well. Yes, I, that definitely pr has protected me a lot in a lot of situations. So definitely have a vesting schedule. Um, we have time for one more question. All right, if there's no other questions, um, we are gonna let you all go and also thank Nita so much for this wonderful traction class. This is super, super important in terms of helping you all hit your traction goals, whether it is revenue, getting more users, raising capital, understanding the numbers are so important to help support you in making the impact you want. Nita, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, we also are going to send a recap as well. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I'm on startupcfosolutions.com. Got it. And we'll um, thanks a, so much, everyone. This has been great. Yes, and we'll do a recap and send this all to you, plus the recording. Um, you can connect with her on LinkedIn as well. Here is her website she drops gems every week on linkedin i'm not even shitting you i actually do enjoy seeing her post yeah, so i love to follow her she's awesome um oh, well best of luck everyone I, I really wish you all the best with your businesses and please reach out and let me know if i can help in any way um and and have a wonderful day and i'm going to now go and have my cup of coffee this has been yeah. such a wonderful start to my day so thank you awesome enjoy the rest of your day everyone see you next time thank you.